So um, how are you all feeling about the upcoming exam? How have you been preparing? Oh yeah, thanks started. Hannah. This, this is the first thing I started. I haven't started preparing yet because I had two exams this week. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay. Again, if if you have a good understanding of the study guide, you're gonna you're gonna be okay. Okay, you really will. I promise. Um, put if you guys could put your name and your professor, uh, whether it's myself or Dr. Kershaw in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, it's always important to see who can make it to study study sessions. I know I know it's hard. So um, for anybody who has started preparing, how, how are you guys doing? Hannah? I'm going just going over the um just reviewing the re-ins, going over the um the recorded lessons and just basically comparing it to the study guide. Yep. And it should be pretty pretty similar. Yeah. I make quizlets of the study guide. Okay. Because I study better with like flashcards. So I'll do like quizlets for the study guide. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, Hannah, when you have a minute, share that Quizlet with me after the exam, after, you know, whenever, I, I just want to see how you put it together. So that's actually a really good idea. Really yeah, good. Yeah, I do that for all, all of my exams and I'll play yeah. like the matching game with yeah. it where I have yeah. to like match the term and everything. Yeah. I yeah, can send, send it to you. Send that to me. Uh, I'd love to take a look at it. Um, okay, let's get going because like I said, I have to teach in an hour and I want to get through the study guide for you guys. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? I can only see a few of you now. So please, this is interactive. This is for you. Okay. So, um, I have summarized your readings in the beginning of the study guide as a quick reference to go back to, okay? Those of you in my Friday night class, we haven't done week nine yet. We'll do that in a bit here. <clears throat> um, same kind of exams as the first two, 50 questions, uh, 75 minutes, basic math calculations, um, you know, if you struggle with math, you do have a lot of resources I've provided you. Um, and uh, hopefully you you have looked at some of those. I've given you kind of uh, quick cheat sheets on how to develop formula, how to put together formulas, uh, IV drip calculations, the formulas for that, uh, conversions. Okay, they're pretty simple math questions. Okay, hopefully... Um, you have been looking at the concepts that we're working on each week, right? And, um, prioritization questions. I've done a lot of reviews and I've got to tell you guys a couple of things. One is here, here are the common, whoops. Here are the common things I'm finding. Okay, so this is more tips for you guys. Okay, here are the common things I'm finding. Hold in on, my wait, wait. Oh, hello? I am just letting everybody in here. So everybody that's coming in now, if you could put your name uh, and professor in the chat box, that would be great. I would appreciate it. Okay, so here's some of the things I'm finding. I'm finding that um, students are not reading the questions closely, meaning that you're missing key words. You have a scrap piece of paper next to you. As you're reading a question, write down a prior a word that comes out. Okay, best, least, greatest, first, last, uh, uh, initial, whatever that keyword is, because that keyword is going to lead you to the answer. And I just have seen numerous, numerous times of of students not being able to pull out the a a good a, a priority phrase or a priority word in the question. OK, because if you get a question that says, what would what should the nurse do first? 
Okay. All the other, I mean, all the other answers are fine, right? But the correct answer is what should be done first. Does that make sense? So looking at really looking at questions um, carefully, I encourage you to read the question at least twice. You might you might not have picked up on that a keyword or a phrase the first time around. And with regards to reading a question twice, if you can't figure, if you are clueless after reading it twice, you're going to have to try and guess the right answer and move on. Okay, it doesn't make any sense to stay on that question and get yourself frustrated and get anxious and lose confidence. Read the question twice. If you have no clue, do your best guess and move on. Okay, for those of you that change answers, okay, here's a good rule of thumb. Do not change your answer unless you can completely convince yourself why you chose the first answer and not you know, oh, I think I read that somewhere and maybe I heard that somewhere. That's not good enough to change an answer. You need to have, you need to be able to articulate to yourself um, why that answer was incorrect before you change it. It's a terrible habit. So um, let's see, what was my other, my other tip? Um Changing answers. Where's my little tool? Hang on a second. Um, use your time wisely. Okay. I need to stop and share for a second because I want to go get a tool that, I, oops. Hmm. Let's see. It is my, hang on one sec. exam tool. Okay. Let me get my other tool for you guys. Oops. That's it. Okay. So, oh, that's my other two. That's my other one. Okay. So I want try and answer the question in your head first before looking at the answers. See if you can come up with something that, see if you can come up with the right answer in your head. Right. And then look at the answers and see if there's something that is similar or is the right answer. Okay. Use your scrap piece of paper, write down keywords. Okay, that's where a lot of students miss questions is they miss the keyword in the question. Okay, so those are the typical, the, the most common errors I find when I review with the students. Um, the uh, prioritization questions. Um, and then select all the apply. Don't be afraid to select all. Okay, I hear that a lot you know, where all five answers are correct and the student only picks four. And then he or she says, oh, I didn't think it would be all of them. <coughs> Excuse me. It, don't be afraid to, if all of them look right, select all. Of them. Okay. Questions. Anybody else have any good tips they want to share with everybody? Tips for test taking. I sent out a lot of resources at the beginning of the term for test taking, breaking down questions, how to eliminate incorrect answers right away. Um, so those are all available to you as well. I don't know if you've been using them throughout the term. Um, and I'll say to the, all the people that came in, please put your name and your professor in the chat. Um, the study guide um, is a compilation of your readings, your lecture material, and your notes. Okay, so the study guide is a summary of all that. Okay, so if you have a good understanding of the study guide, you will do well on the exam. Okay. So let's go to the study guide. Back to the study guide. Okay, so am I sharing my screen? Oh, I didn't share my screen, did I? <sighs> okay. 
Okay, here we are. Um, so again, best practice, review the readings, projects, discussions. You know, if you miss part of class, um, for whatever reason, try and go back and listen to that part of class that you missed. Um, try and attend um, review sessions, which you guys are doing now. Um, so I've broken out this study guide um, into different concepts that were covered during the last three weeks. Okay, so the first concept was um, STDs. And I've even put where, what chapter it was in and what book for easy reference for you guys. Okay, so we're not gonna go through every single part of this study guide. I just wanna show you how it's set up. Okay, if anybody wants to stop me in any of these sections, please stop me. But so with regards to sexually transmitted infections, this is what you need to know right here. That's it. Okay. Uh, well, th in this section for HIV, you need to know these five bullets for chlamydia. Uh, these are all ST under the STD category. Syphilis. Okay. What do we know about syphilis? If it's not treated with antibiotics in the primary or secondary stages, it becomes latent. And what does latent mean? It don't show up. There are right. like it lies dormant. Yeah, it's dormant. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we need to know about the uh, herpes as an STD. Um, is it viral or bacterial? Is it contagious? Yes. Is it not limited to the general area? No, it's not. Okay. A lot, you know, a lot of this exam is med surge. We covered a lot of med surge uh, topics. So hopefully you've covered this as well in med surge. Okay. And then HPV. What do I want you to know about HPV? Who, who can, who's at risk, right? How many vaccines do you need? Um, what age group do they start it? It's all in these bullets. Okay, so the CD recommends HPV vaccine for preteens, start as early as age nine. Recommended three doses of the vaccine. Okay, and so that's what, those are the STDs that I want you to be aware of, HIV, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes, and HPV, the five of them, okay? The next section we covered, uh, this isn't in order of weeks, um, but we covered inf infection prevention and control. It's in chapter 17 of your fundamentals book and uh, there are the page numbers. Okay, so what kinds of what kinds of conditions, what kinds of diseases fall under infection, uh, infection prevention and control? Hepatitis. What is hepatitis? Okay. What is hepatitis A? What is it? Hepatitis B? What is hepatitis C? Okay. And then you're going to get asked in the exam about TB. Okay. How is it transmitted? Airborne, it's airborne. How do you how do you screen for it? Right, a skin test. Okay, have you guys studied TB? Have you studied infectious diseases in med surge? Yes. Okay. Have you studied TB? You learned about TB? Yes. I'm yes. Not Okay, good, great. And then what about smallpox? No. Okay, this is what we need to know about smallpox. Okay, can or cannot be contagious. Um, usually can, if it's contagious, it's contagious, most contagious during the, the next, the two stages, early rash in the scabs. Okay, smallpox, we treat like chickenpox as well. You're not contagious when things are scabbed over. 
right? It may present as high fever, head and body aches, sometimes vomiting. Okay. Um, a rash, early rash. Okay, this is this is smallpox. Okay. In the in the first four days, yes, contagious, right? First four days, most contagious, and then it shows you how it goes through how the rash starts, where it starts. Okay, and gives you a description of the what, what the rash looks like. Okay, then then by the fourth day, skin sores. Okay, they fill up. Once the skin sores fill up with fluid, you may get a fever again. And the fever may stay high until all these scabs are, are scabbed over. Okay, and then it goes through the, the, the scab stage. Okay, until these scabs are crusted over, it's gonna be contagious, okay? And then foodborne illness and safety, what do we wanna know about that? Obviously good universal precautions, right? Washing your hands before and after handling food. And here's a couple of specifics. Separate raw and cooked food, thaw frozen food in a refrigerator or not in a countertop, Okay, cook food thoroughly, do not eat hamburger, meat rare, and on. Okay, so these are the things I want you to know about what are the risk factors and what do we do to prevent it with regards to food safety. Okay, and then we have waterborne infectious diseases. And how do they, how are they transmitted? Typically through animal and human fecal contamination, cholera and giardia, pretty common, maybe seen in patients with no water in their house or in third world countries. We always hear about uh, cholera outbreaks in underdeveloped countries. Okay, what do you guys know what a vector-borne illness is? What's a vector-borne illness? This falls under infectious diseases. What's a vector? Is it like something like a host that carries something? Yep. Like a tick, mosquito. Okay. Those are vector borne illnesses. So there's four of them to know about Lyme disease, which is carried by ticks, Zika is carried by mosquitoes. Zika can be quite dangerous um, for a pregnant woman. Rocky mounted spotted fever, that's carried by the dog tick. Okay. And then malaria. Okay. Mosquitoes. So those are the four vector borne illnesses. Okay. And then what about disaster management? You're going to be asked about disaster management on the exam. What do we want to know? Well, we want to know there's two types of disasters. What are the two types? Natural and man-made. Yep. And what's an example of a natural? Tornado. Earthquake. Earthquake. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes. Mm -hmm. What's a man-made disaster? Pollution, warfare. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, I want you to go back to MedSurg, your chapter 44 in MedSurg, because I want you to read about what the Healthy People 2030 objectives are for disease in mid... Whoops. Hmm. What did I just do? Okay, so Healthy People 2020 has objectives. 
that focus on preparing, alerting, and caring for a disaster within a population. Okay. Um, they look at disease mitigation, right? And one of their objectives focuses on increasing the proportion of crisis and emergency messages to protect the public. So one of their objectives focuses on communication. Okay. And then how do you prepare a, how do you help a family, teach a family how to prepare a kit for a disaster? What needs to be in it? There's some specifics, right? So here's your specifics right here. Instruct the family, stock enough food for three days. Okay, that's one. So let's say this is a select all that apply question. What do you need to do to prepare a kit? Stock enough food for three days. That's one thing. Review the kit every six months. That's another. Ensure that all the members of the family know where the kit is. That's another. And we got to make sure everybody knows how to turn off the utilities in the house. That's another. Okay. Why do we review the kit every six months? You know, if you haven't spent a lot of time on the study guide, then this is, you know, all we're just going through it for the first time. Um, it can be overwhelming. That's why I'm trying to break down each little bullet here. Okay. So why do you think we review, we have families review their kits every six months? What are we looking for? Expire items. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you get a question um, about how do you teach a family to do a preparation kit for disaster, these are the things that you want to tell them. Okay. And then you may get asked about what is a, what's mass, what is the purpose of a mass casualty exercise? Anybody know that? Evaluate the agency's response time and validate capabilities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's right here in your study guide. Okay, so what they're looking for is what's the response time? How, how long does it take e emergency services to get activated? Obviously, the earlier the response is, the decrease, you know, casualties, and it also gets the resources going early. Okay, so the, the goal of these exercises, has anybody ever participated in a mass casualty exercise? Where they bring all the, everybody who's gonna be involved together and you do a, a mock, a mock disaster, right? And then you figure out what went well, what didn't go well, okay? And then when a federal emergency emerge, when a federal emergency has been declared, who responds? What is the agency who responds? Well, right here, the national framework, national response framework. Okay, and what do they do? Okay, right here. They assist with transportation, temporary housing, medical resources, search and rescue, and firefighting. That could potentially be a select all that apply question. I'd like to also think about if you're reading this, what kind of question might you get asked? Well, this paragraph has a lot of information. If you get a question about who's the agency, who's the agency that gets involved with a disaster? Okay. So you need to know the national response framework is the agency. And then what do they do? What do they assist with? Transportation, housing, medical resources, search and rescue and firefighting. Okay. A nurse can delegate to a CNA to remove patients from an accident or danger of a disaster, safety first. Okay, what about water? 
after a disaster, when is water considered safe for drinking? Okay. By boiling. Boiling, treating with household bleach or removing hot water heaters or commode tanks. Yeah, but boiling is the most common. Okay. What happens if you're involved in a chemical spill? How do you remove your clothing? Tongue. With the use of tongue. Mm -hmm. Everybody know that? Okay. What are some what are some chemical agents? I list them right here. There's three of them. And I give you an example. I give you an example. Okay, there's three. Beskin agents, nerve agents, and blood agents. Okay. And I give you the couple of examples of them. Okay. And what the comp what the most common complications are. So with the Veskin agents, for example, mustard. Okay. Dermal, skin, and respiratory. Well, skin and respiratory complications. What's an example of a nerve and nerve agent? That would be sarin gas. That's associated with respiratory complications. Okay, and what if it's blood agents like cyanide? Okay, that's dermal and respiratory complications. So knowing the three different kinds of potential chemical agents and what is their primary impact? And always safety first. So we're following the ABC protocol for all chemical disasters, which is what? Airway, breathing, and circulation. Okay, you with me? Yeah. You you yes. getting or you guys getting organized as I'm going through this? Yeah, this absolutely. It's all pretty methodical. Okay. Um, okay, the next section we talked about, I think it was in week eight, was post op care. What do we need to know about post-op care? Well, what is post-op care? Where are they coming from? Surgery. Surgery. Right. right. So they most likely had anesthesia. And so what's the first, what's our first priority? ABC. ABC Ooh. and safety and pain. Yep. Yeah. Okay. What are some potential complications? Okay, so potential complications would be airway and breathing issues, atelectasis. Okay, that's a complication. However, if you read in your post-op section, a mild atelectasis is expected. Okay, we're talking full-blown, but mild is expected. That's important to know the difference. Pneumonia, pulmonary emboli, respiratory depression from pain medications or anesthesia. Okay, sepsis, dehydration, these are all potential complications post-op. UTIs from catheterization, skin, wound healing, nausea due to medications or anesthesia, constipation due to pain meds. So there's some, there's our common complications, okay? How do we do assessments in the post-op stage? What are we assessing? Respiratory rate, O2 sats, lung sounds, level of consciousness, mental status, wound, pain, bowel sounds, bowel movements. Right, you probably learned all of this in med search, so this should be a review. Okay, and then you have your Aldred score. Okay, this is the score they put together for you. You want somewhere between eight and 10 to be able to take the patient out of the PACU post op unit to go to the floor or ICU or wherever they need to go, wherever they need to go. Okay. You can stay in the PACU up to eight hours, okay? Until these scores are in the right range. 
Okay, couple of good things to know. Thrombophlebitis post-op complication can occur days after surgery, right? And then the history of a stroke, you have a higher risk for a stroke as a post-op complication. Do we need to, could somebody mute themselves with the music in the background? That'd be great. Okay, so that's our post-op. And then we learned about cirrhosis. What are some common causes of cirrhosis? Falls. What? Falls. Common causes, oh, the causes of cirrhosis. Um, yeah. Alcoholism. Yep. Hep B and C. Yep. Okay. What is what are patients generally present with? Here's a list: fatigue, weakness, headache. Okay. Okay. Jaundice. Okay. So here's, whoops. So there's all the potential symptoms that they may present with. Jaundice, pale colored stools, stools, dark urine, urine, which is caused by bile not le uh, leaving the liver. I think I asked this in class in week eight. You guys have covered cirrhosis in med surge, right? Yeah. Here's an interesting fact. Elevation in liver enzymes doesn't usually occur until 65% of the liver function is gone. <coughs> That's a lot. And then what are some interventions for cirrhosis? Okay, you can go through and read those. Okay. And then we went through um, peripheral artery disease, page 416 to 420 in your med surge book. What is it? This first bullet tells you what it is. I'm sure you've covered this in med surge as well. Please read your interventions. What, because a lot of our role is teaching. Right, so what are the interventions? What are we gonna to talk to the patient? Can you scroll back up really fast? To, oh, um, sorry. The peripheral, I just wanna see. Yep. Oh, okay, this is. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to compare okay. something. So again, we went through all this in class. This is more of a summary that you need to be familiar with. What are the interventions since we're gonna be teaching patients about that? Okay, I should say cover. Cover ulcers with occlusive dressing, smoking cessation. Okay, and then the next next condition was uh, chronic venous in insufficiency. Again, this first paragraph is a description of what it is. What causes it? What you might see and what the interventions are. Okay, then we covered hypertension. Okay, what is hypertension? All right here. Okay, what, what are some causes of vasoconstriction? What are some contributing factors? Okay. And what are some interventions? And again, when you're reading through all of this, you've got to be able to try and apply your ad pie to a community setting, okay? Your community patient may be a, a, an individual client, a family, or a subset of the population, okay? And then the next topic, topic was chronic, chronic venous, venous insufficiency. There's a description of it. Here's your interventions. Again, a summary from your notes and your reading. And then we cover diabetes type one and type two. Okay, the first we cover is type two. Which one is insulin dependent? Type one. Okay. Okay. Here's your symptoms, recurrent infections, poor wound healing, initial weight loss, 
prior to treatment. Here's our interventions for type two. Okay. Could be reversible with weight loss, could be reversible with dietary modifications, regular exercise, stress reduction. You want your A1C to be under 6.5. You want to teach the patient how to monitor themselves for hypoglycemia. What is hypo? Is that low or high? Low. And how do you treat a low? Oh. Um, give them glucose, candy. candy, juice, no potassium. Because most yep. people that are diabetic will have renal issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So here's our treatment for hypoglycemia. Like you said, juices, soda, we're wanting to get their blood sugar up real quick. Okay. For a diet, what do you, what do you, this is important to when we're teaching patients, what kind of diet should they be on? Protein and non mm -hmm. carbohydrate. Yeah. I mean, I said fats, fruits, veggies, lumens, mm -hmm. nuts, yeah. Dash diet, right? Pardon me? Is it called the DASH diet? I haven't heard of that. What's a DASH diet? We just went over it and um peas. I don't even it was like um poultry and fish and then yeah. fruits and vegetables and all that mm -hmm. stuff. That's for hypertension. Oh, is that one for whoops? <laughs> mm -hmm. My bad. Thanks, Markel. And then type, here's some um, information about type 1 diabetes, okay? Which organ does diabetes affect? What's the issue? What's the issue with diabetes? The pancreas okay. no longer um, produces insulin. Yeah, I would say it's a myth. <laughs> yeah, the the pa it doesn't make enough insulin. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. what are the symptoms of it this is important here i worked in the schools for 20 years had a lot of new new diabetics diagnosed during the school years and really? they presented with these kinds of things in the clinic takes a while to figure it out but it's good to know what these symptoms are what kids or adults might present with okay so we have two, we have hypoglycemia. It can happen quickly and it needs to be treated quickly. Okay. And then we have hyperglycemia, which is too high, right? So we need to, we need, what do we need to be doing? No, one of the, one of the severe symptoms of hyperglycemia is called DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, mm -hmm. right? And this could be life-threatening. Okay, um, so if your blood sugar is too high and you go into DKA, okay, which could be because you're sick, could be because you didn't take your insulin. Okay, there's your three classic symptoms of DKA. Fruity breath, polyuria, and thirst. And then if you can't get this reversed, um, the, some of the later symptoms, it gets pretty serious. Um, and then here's some insulin education. Has anybody ever taught diabetic patients about how to care for themselves, test blood sugar, give insulin? Uh, yeah, just along those lines, nothing real. Mm -hmm. Detail because I'm too scared that I might tell them something wrong. No. Yeah, I've worked in the schools for 20 years and saw lots of new diabetic kids at all ages from preschool all the way up to high school. Wow. So, yeah, it can be scary, but <clears throat> they rely on us, um, all of us. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're working with clients with diabetes in the community, at what age you're relied upon very heavily for? comfort and education, um, competency. So management. yeah, management. Okay. Um, 
another another topic hospital associated infections right what are contact precautions and airborne precautions right so what do we want to know about hospital associated infections you use proper hand uh, hand hygiene before and after patient care we know that n95 for airborne illnesses right so what might that be what kind of patient would that be tuberculosis patient TB. Yep. Private room or negative pressure room. Contact yeah. precautions. What are those? Gloves to prevent contact with wound secretions. I always say I was trained all my teachers and staff always have gloves on mm -hmm. when working with anybody. Working with a kid, uh, same at the hospital. Always, you have, always have gloves on to protect you from coming in contact from any kinds of secretions, any kind of bodily fluids. Okay. Mm -hmm. HIPAA. We need to know a couple of things about HIPAA. Okay, HIPAA. What is HIPAA? Do you guys know what HIPAA is? The Insurance Portability and mm -hmm. Accountability Act of nineteen ninety six. And what is it? It's simply put to protect sensitive patient health information from being disclosed without the patient's consent. That is the whole basis for HIPAA. You have to give consent for your health information to be shared. Every time you go to a doctor's office now or hospital or wherever, you always have to sign that paperwork, right? And the last page is HIPAA. I give permission for this doctor's office to whatever. Okay. And what's the privacy rule? Okay. You are going to get asked a couple of questions about HIPAA on the exam. Okay. It's right in here. The privacy rule standards address the use of disclosure of health information. Okay. This is known as protected health information. Okay. By entities subject to the privacy rule. Right. So, it essentially means that you have to give permission for any entity to access your medical records. Okay. So you're saying the patient has to give permission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And, and take this one step further. What are covered entities? Okay. Cause that's what the rule. Okay. Uh, covered entities. Discuss the patient only with the staff involved in patient care. Right. There are rules on how information is stored and conveyed. Information needs to be kept in a secure area on the computer. Your, the privacy rule also contains standards for individual rights, right? To understand and control how, th how their health information is used. Okay. A major goal of the privacy rule is to make sure that individuals' health information is properly protected while allowing the flow of health information needed to provide quality care. Right? So... It means that we have to be mindful. We have to be, it has to be a priority priority of ours when we're taking care of patients that we can't be discussing patients in the break room or we shouldn't be discussing patients on lunch break. Mm -hmm. Okay, the information that patient has a right to privacy. Okay. Uh, and then malpractice. What is malpractice? A practice is considered negligence by a professional person. All four of these elements need to be met for malpractice to have happened. Okay. You have a duty to provide the best care possible. Okay. You breach your duty, whether it was through an act of omission or an act, uh, uh, an act that was wrong. Okay, the causation of it, what caused it? 
And was there injury or damage? So a couple of examples, falsifying documents or charting, causing direct injury to patients that otherwise wouldn't have been injured if it wasn't for your breach of duty. Death caused some problems created by nursing. Okay. Cultural considerations of religious influence on patient care. Okay. Certain religions only eat, only eat certain butchered meats, right? Jewish eats, eats kosher meat. Muslims have no pork. Okay. So we are, some of our cultural considerations when we're taking care of patients are their diet, smoking, how is smoking viewed in their culture, drug use, herbals, nutrition in general, caffeine, alcohol, food, prep, food preparation, and reading materials. So one of the things that we've talked about this is cultural competence. I've talked about this on and on and on in my class. We have to be culturally competent to be able to take care of different groups of patients. Okay. We may not know all the answers to these with a certain culture that we're taking care of, a patient we're taking care of, but we can ask, right? What are your beliefs? You know, if, if it, if it is involving their patient care. Okay. Um, we need to be knowledgeable. Okay. Do you have certain diet restrictions? Do you have certain diet preferences? Right? Do you have a certain belief about the way your food should be prepared? Do you take herbal medicines? Okay, so these are just some cultural considerations, just some categories. Okay, then a couple of other things. What your LPN scope of practice? Review what you can and cannot delegate. Okay, you need to know that. What can you guys should know by now? What you can and cannot delegate to a nursing assistant, and what types of clients you cannot be assigned. You can't assign a nursing assistant. For example, you wouldn't assign a nursing assistant patients who are extremely unstable, would you? No. No. Okay. So you need to know those two parts of your scope of practice. What can you delegate to a nurse a CNA? And what patients can you not delegate to a CNA? Okay. And then the last is the prevention of accidents. Prevention of accidents. Um, this is chapter 45, Med Surge. Um, please read through the sections of home safety, highway safety, and water safety. I think it's on this, it's maybe one or two pages. Okay. What kinds of things do we need to do to keep our home safe? What kinds of things do we need to do for driving and highway safety, like seat belts and um, not being impaired? Water safety. What do we what do we do with water safety? What do you do if somebody's drowning? There's a short part in chapter 35 that addresses all three. Please read through that. You will get a couple of questions on these. Okay. I think that's your study guide. Helpful to go through it like this. Yes, thank you. And again, if you haven't re started reviewing the study guide yet, all this is going to seem foreign to you and probably a little bit overwhelming. So um, just take it in stride, okay? The study guide is very organized into different sections, okay? So tackle one section at a time, you know, maybe highlight what you got down and you know, and maybe highlight in a different color what you need to go back and look at a little bit more. Okay. It's, uh, it's straightforward. Okay. There's no trick questions on the exam. Okay. And that's the other thing about questions. 
what you need to answer the question is right. What the information you need to answer the question is right in the question. Okay. You don't need to be thinking, mm, well, what, what might've happened? Well, what if this happens or just use the information in the question to answer it. Don't overthink it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I hope this was helpful. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to go take a quick little break before I teach in five minutes. Um, for those of you that are in my Friday class, feel free to just stay on, but I'm all done. Um, I will send this recording out to all the sections. Make sure your name's in the um, box in the chat. Oh, but I do have to end it to stop the recording. So I do have to end it and then I'll start it up again. So you're going to have to rejoin. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.